I'm Antonio Graceffo. We're at SSA headquarters at Lloyd Lang. Right now, we're at the extreme end of, end of the Shine controlled area. If you look out here, you'll see a very beautiful valley and some mountains, hills, trees. It's actually quite beautiful if you didn't know what it was. One time, this valley was full of tribal villages. Those people have been displaced by the SPDC. And in fact, the IDPs, the internally displaced people that I've interviewed on this show, a lot of them came from this valley. So we see the results. We see, see the people now in the IDP village. This is where they used to live in this beautiful village where they had their rice fields and where their families were living in safety and happiness. The SPDC drove them out. And why? It's because of the production of heroin. From this area, they're able to control the production of heroin. We see these other hills over here. Each of these hilltops is, is a location of the WA State Army, the WSA. The WSA is seen as a proxy army under the control of the SPDC, or let's say in cahoots with the SPDC, in cooperation to help control the drugs trade. Over here on the right, which I don't know if you can quite see, but there's actually a production facility for heroin. That's actually a production facility for heroin. Now I'm told that below that, that hilltop, there's a village of mostly Shan people who are kept pretty much as slaves and forced to grow the opium, forced to grow the poppies for the opium production. So we have slavery, we have drugs trade, and we have murder, and we have displaced people. And this is the life of the Shan villagers. <laughs> After a hard day at war, nothing goes down better than an ice cold Coke. Coke, the choice of combat. This is one of the uh, defense trenches that's used to hold this position, and as I said, this position is at the last, the last boundary of the Shan-controlled area. The, the Wa State Army is about two to three hundred meters over that way. Now you see here, this is a trench, like a World War One-style trench. It's got sort of a zigzag pattern, and the reason why is that if someone were to drop into the trench, if an enemy were to infiltrate and begin firing, you wouldn't have a clear line of fire all the way down the trench, or if, or if uh, an explosive of some type were to come in here, the explosion wouldn't get channeled through the trench and kill everybody. But it's pretty sad that people have to live like this, and I also couldn't imagine being in these trenches during the rainy season, so it takes you right back to stories you've read about World War I. Anyway, I'm Antonio Graceffo on the front lines, and please... Say a prayer for the people of Burma. I'm Antonio Brusefo. We're in the Shan State of Burma. We're at Loy Tulang SSA headquarters, Shan State Army headquarters, and this is the clinic. And with me today is a very interesting, wonderful gentleman. His name is Steve. Steve, what's your full name? Steve Gamer. Okay. Well, what's the name of your organization? We're called Partners Relief and Development. Partners Relief and Development. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we started in 1994. It was a backpack trip that my wife and I made to Shoglo refugee camp and when we saw the condition of the people, especially the children there, and understood how little it took to make a, a dramatic impact in their well-being, we felt compelled to get involved. So in 94 we made a $30 commitment to one child whose parents were shot and killed. $30 and, and that sustained the child for one month? $30 for a year. Yeah, $30 for one year to save a child. Now what a lot of people may or may not know is that this war in Burma has produced a lot of refugees. It's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. There's a few, a few, a few million refugees. Is it millions? Yeah. It's millions, mostly in northern Thailand, yeah? No, they're scattered in Bangladesh, India, uh, some in China, some in Laos, mostly not registered as refugees, they're just displaced people who hide in the jungle or in the woods okay. to, and avoid contact with people or force. And the camp that you went to with your wife, that was in? That was um, right on the border in Thailand. So okay. in Thailand there's 140,000 approximately that, that was the number I was thinking. refugees. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in Thailand about 140,000, but for the entire conflict it's, the number runs into the millions and of course no one knows the exact number because they're not all registered, right? Yeah. Okay, so you and your wife went to a refugee camp. Now what ethnicity were the people there? The people we first met were Karen, 
And the Karen have fight, been fighting a resistance, their revolution, for more than 50 years now, um, since General Ni Win took power, mm -hmm. central power over Burma. So what that has produced, like you said, is over a million internally displaced people, and then a few million people who have scattered into the poorest border regions or um, have gotten uh, refugee status in other countries. Right, we, which is a minority, isn't it? The ones that have been taken to other countries. Yeah. It's, it's a small minority. Uh, yeah, I don't know those numbers, but yeah. yeah. It's a small number. You know, for And again, the internally displaced people, the IDP, this means people who have been driven at, away from their home, away from their village. Generally, it's because the SPDC has burned their village, or ordered them out forcibly. It's complicated, but they one way or another they attack mm -hmm. the population and make their lives untenable. Okay, and then these people remain inside of the boundaries of Burma, but they're internally displaced, so they're living in camps, makeshift villages yeah. and makeshift camps, and here at Lloyd Lang we have such a camp, and we have, uh, I've been told 350 families. Yeah, that sounds right. Is, is that yeah. right? Okay. About 3,000 people, that's right. Oh, yeah, so what, and so, so you, you're in this, this, uh, you were in a refugee camp and you found out that for thirty dollars you were essentially able to save one child. Or yeah. sustain one child put a, for one put year. Put a child through school and buy the things that they <laughs> that child needed to survive. Okay. And a woman a woman who was actually raped and tortured for nine months, she asked us if we'd tell our friends in the West about what's happening in Burma and um, explain that to them and ask them to participate financially so that uh, she could help kids like that first child. So we did that. We started a, a newsletter in 1995 called Partners, and that's that's been our platform to grow until now. Okay, and you and you more or less grew up in Thailand, or you've been here. I came here when I was in 80, 87. 87. So. And he speaks Thai really well, much better than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but. I've been here for most of my adult life. Most of your adult life. So the partners organization, what kind of things do you do? We have four programs. Our biggest one is relief for those internally displaced people, mostly. Um, second program is assistance to children, child welfare. We run 27 homes in eight refugee camps, helping roughly 1,500 children. Um, and then we do education and other child welfare projects inside Burma. Third program is capacity building, and that's any of our training or counseling. We train, uh, we bring in pastors sometimes, and they train pastors in the IDP communities, uh, especially with pastoral counseling to help victims of torture or mm -hmm. rape or abuse. Mm -hmm. And post-traumatic stress. PTSD and, like that, and yeah. trauma therapy. And then the, the fourth program is um, development. We put in water projects, animal husbandry, agriculture, aquaculture, different things to give them a sustainable way to provide. เป็นโชคร้ายที่กระหน่ำลุ่มซ้ำ